is the fifth generation Subaru Forester. Oh, it looks so exciting. Oh my God, this car actually did it. You heard it guys. The most unquestionable thing about this car is the rally reputation and also the Subaru reliability guys. Hello everyone. Today is a very special day because today I'm going to be reviewing and test driving this Subaru Forester, guys. Now, this will be the first time ever that I am going to be driving a Subaru and let alone a Forester. Now, I'm going to tell you all something about uh, what I know of Subaru. Um, I know a lot about Subaru, but the thing is that it's a very special brand because they never actually had great presence here in Belgium. And it's ironic I say this because I've been to England uh, before and in England they're just everywhere. They dominate the roads there. Uh, I know a friend of mine who worked in Switzerland for Subaru and he told me they sold like hotcakes in Switzerland. Which doesn't surprise me because of the geographical location of Switzerland. But here in Belgium, Subaru has become a very... I don't know if it's very they, they've lost public presence and it's almost a similar fate like Mitsubishi to some extent um, they used to be something very big here in the early 2000s and in the 90s they used to dominate our roads they used to be everywhere they, they were actually particularly famous for their reliability their design and their reputation in the rally. In my hometown, just outside Brussels, I used to see a Subaru Forester first generation driving on our roads. It was adorable, guys, but uh, I have to confess it did look a bit dated. That's because it was a early 2000s model. The first generation was from the late 90s or early 2000s, guys, so it doesn't surprise me it looked dated, and that was a similar case for every single car from that era. Uh, over here is the first generation Subaru Forester. Now, over here is the second generation Subaru Forester. Now, this is the third generation Subaru Forester. And then we move forward to the fourth generation, guys. The fourth generation Subaru. Now, here's something I have to note. Over here is the fifth generation Subaru Forester. Oh, it looks so exciting! But is that excitement really something to be excited about? We will have a look in a moment, guys. But let me tell you all something. I love the second generation Subaru. Let's just rewind a little bit. Okay, so, uh, second generation, where are you? This is the second generation Subaru uh, Forester. I love it. The second generation looks adorable. It looks like an estate... Okay, the first two generation look like estate wagons that were given four-wheel drive, okay? So imagine something like a Volvo with four-wheel drive transmission and a bit more reliable and more reputed in the snow and in the sand. That's Subaru for you. Uh, that's something the European brands have a curse for never being able to achieve. The European brands did achieve two things. Identity desirability oh and actually the third thing would be performance road performance they everyone loves the european brands the state wagons they made like the state wagons from uh, volvo estate wagons from bmw estate wagons from mercedes um however estate wagons from subaru they were unique in their own nature however the third generation subaru forester was I have no idea what they were thinking. I have no idea what they were thinking, but it looked as though it was a transition period. They were going from being an estate wagon to being a crossover SUV. And then the fourth generation Subaru Forester was horrible. I absolutely had no idea what they were thinking. Uh, but my best guess tells me is that they were trying to be more of a crossover SUV by that point. They kind of abandoned the estate wagon concept and they moved forward to being a crossover SUV. Now, I have to remark something, and that is the culture of estate wagons is slowly dying because now there's high demand for premium cars, premium estate wagons. Now, estate wagons have moved on to a premium side of things, you see. So the only brands that are offering estate wagons here in Belgium are mainly premium brands, or even Audi with the RS6 Avante, which is basically an estate wagon with, with you know, the sporty vibe about it. And it has its own style. It's a, it's a very good style. I like it. And I love the BMW 5 Series estate. But 
it's it's no longer about mass market guys it's now it's all about being premium the only brand that offers cheap estate wagons would be i have to say skoda and volkswagen but skoda has now earned a well it's it's now i with the volkswagen politics with the volkswagen group with skoda and volkswagen is that you pay more and then only you get it so unless you don't pay more you don't get it so you know whether it's very family friendly or not you be the judge. But we're not going to talk about that. Right now, we're going to talk about this wonderful Subaru Forester, the fifth generation. Whew. Let's see how this goes, guys. Does this Subaru Forester have what it takes to be just like its ancestor models back in the 90s who would dominate the rallies? We are going to find out in a moment, guys. Although, we won't be going in rallies. We won't be driving fast. We will be just driving like every other ordinary driver. All right, guys, so this is the key to the Subaru Forester. It looks very nice. It's quite uh, basic. Hmm, interesting. And the only thing you get is uh, the lock button, the unlock button, which is the Subaru badge itself, and the rear lock button. All right, guys, I'm gonna be test driving the Subaru Forester. This is the first time ever driving a Subaru, uh, let alone my favorite model, the Forester. Believe it or not, I always loved the Forester. All right, so uh, we roll. So I kept the car in drive. Let's see if the car moves after I release the brakes. Yeah, okay. The car tends to move at a snail pace when you get uh, release the brakes. And that's um, that's interesting because most cars would actually move at a walking pace. They move a bit faster, like three kilometers per hour when you put it in drive and let go of the brakes. So with the Subaru, it's a very interesting case what's actually happening. Uh, it's actually moving at a snail pace as I'm speaking to you guys. Uh, Anyways, let's just get down to driving. I'm going to be test driving the acceleration of the Subaru Forester very soon, guys. But first, I'm going to stick to a speed of 50 kilometers per hour, see what it's like to drive on the road. Um, so far, I have to say it's a very smooth ride. Road noise is actually okay. So, uh, so far, suspension-wise, it seems composed. Uh, you do not feel the bumps that much. Although, wait. Actually, I have to say it does register the bumps ever so slightly. Wait. Okay, road noise is okay, although you do hear the engine, so it's like most Japanese uh, crossover SUVs where they have good insulation, but unfortunately the engine is always very proud and loud. So um, whether it's unfortunate or not, you be the judge, but I think it's alright. Um, see how this goes? Quite nice, uh, so far so good. Alright guys, so I am going to be testing the brakes of this uh, Subaru Forester. Let's see whether it's on the sensitive side or on the normal side, you know? Because, and the reason I say this, guys, is because I know some cars which have like super sensitive brakes where just when you brush the brakes, you do an emergency brake. That's a particular problem with the Peugeot 5008. Uh, let's see what the Subaru Forester is like. All right, three, two, one, let's do this. All right, so let's see what it's like to do an emergency brake. All right, guys, so I do an emergency brake and I have to say the car has a tendency to shake a lot. It has a very spongy effect to it, if you think about it. And that's, I think spongy effect is probably normal because of the hybrid system. Uh, in fact, the brakes recharge the hybrid battery with the thermal heat. So um, whatever just happened, I do not know, guys, but we're going to see in uh, normal road conditions. So let's see what happens if I'm at a normal traffic speed driving then I want to engage the brakes okay the brakes feel a bit spongy but I can already confirm to you it is not an emergency brake it doesn't uh, you can do an emergency brake you can execute one by all means but it does it in a very fluent fashion it does not uh, it did not send me diving towards the steering wheel. In fact, everything was very composed the whole time. Uh, yes, I must confess I wasn't at a high speed. Thank goodness for that. Uh, but I have to say it was well composed. Um, spongy. That's all I can say. It was quite spongy. Three, two, one. Ah! Ah! Oh my God! Oh my God, that's Subaru power right there. Uh, I'm not talking about the performance, I'm talking about the engine. <laughs> it 
guys i love the sound of the engine but unfortunately well not unfortunately but i have to say um the car it likes to scream for one second and then only there's motion um, and in the, even in the middle of motion it's a bit hesitant it's like first it's on gear one then it wants to move to gear two this car has potentials but it does feel like uh, as though the car is a bit um it feels as though something is a bit overweight about this car when it comes to acceleration and uh, braking. I, I, I hope this car makes me scream. I hope so. Three, two, one. Okay, can it do it? Can it actually do it? Can it do it? car actually did it the radius of this car is actually surprisingly good um it's just that it's it's not like a bicycle okay it's not like a bicycle but it's better than average it, it's it, better than average crossover suvs like um yeah it, i mean the thing to note about the subaru forester is that it is long and there and also therefore and also it's a heavy vehicle so therefore it's uh, got the steering radius that was a bit like a big van uh, but it's okay. It's not a big issue. At least it was it was decent enough for certain roads. However, is it city friendly? You be the judge, everyone. It's not very clear who exactly is the direct competitor to the Subaru Forester. Every, when when the Subaru Forester had this estate wagon like uh, look to it, the most obvious competitor was Volvo because Volvo is Swedish, and immediately everyone thought of snow. Uh, especially when it came to the Sub Subaru. The performance of the Subaru compared to Volvo, everybody thought, yeah, you know, the, they, they, should be, they both should be tested in the snow. But then Subaru went down the crossover SUV path, just like every other Japanese brand. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, eventually Subaru had to adapt to the market. They had to adapt. And so therefore it was, um, it's, it's very debatable uh, as to whether they did a good decision or not. This is the interior of the Subaru Forester, everyone. So, a uh, very interesting interior. Uh, for a car of 2022, it's got this sort of instrument cluster. Uh, pretty interesting. For a crosser SUV of 40,000 euros and from the 2020s, this kind of dashboard, uh, this kind of instrument cluster seems a little bit... Hmm. I mean, I like the details it's got. It's quite nice. But I just feel like it's a bit old school. Like it, it could have been nicer. If it would have been more pleasant if it had a digital instrument cluster. But it's not that. It's not. All I can say is that it's questionable. That's all I can say. It's not bad. But hey, why not? Over here is your infotainment system, everyone. So if I click on the home button, it takes me to this uh, menu page. Uh, now the infotainment system. Oh, by the way, I like the background. I like how it's showing space in the background. <laughs> Quite nice of Subaru. Uh, pretty cute. Um, so these are all the applications you get. Um, it's very interesting, but at the same time, for a price of 40,000 euros and uh, a car of 2020s, I find this infotainment system to be on the... It's just basic. It gets the job done. That's all I can say. It's not mind-blowing, but hey, it just gets the job done. So if I click on map, you get a nice map over here, which is as good as it has to be. It's kind of, uh, yeah, it's kind of like most maps I've seen. It's not like, you know, thoroughly detailed, but hey, it's almost like Google Maps. So hey, not bad. At least they've tried something. Whenever the car is on, whenever it's in action, uh, these buttons are illuminated. But for some reason, rest of the buttons in the interior are not illuminated. Like over here, you get the climate control. And the climate control buttons are not illuminated. So it's very interesting why these buttons are illuminated and not these. Um, but by the way, let's just check what happens when we turn on the lights. So. Aha. Okay, now when we turn on the lights, so whenever it's night or something, um, all the buttons illuminate. So this whole thing illuminates. Very good. And so do the buttons on the steering wheel. And then so does the control right here, guys. By the way, these are heated seats. Uh, ooh. Oh, you get camera button right here. We're going to see in a moment what it does. But over here is sort of your off-road controls. By the way, with this sort of knob, this is something Land Rover sort of started. So it's kind of interesting how pretty much every brand in the market has this sort of knob uh, for their 4x4 four, four four control. And over here is your handbrake, guys. Okay, guys, I'm going to show you something that I've never, ever, ever, ever seen in any car before. Uh, maybe it exists still, but I... Okay, I, I just check this out, okay? 
This is the light intensity, all right? By the way, this is the first time I see this whole thing in action and use. So, you know, at least there's no button left, uh, you know, there's no slot left uh, unused. Everything is in action here. Very good. That's the advantage I see. By the way, this is the light intensity. So check out what happens when I roll this. Oh my God. Power off, power up, power off, power up. Power off? <laughs> okay, perhaps it's not a good idea to be playing around with this, but uh, you get the point, guys. I mean, it's so, like, this is the first time I've ever seen this in any car, guys. I mean, whenever I press this button right here, info, info affects whatever goes on right here. So, let's do this. It shows you more uh, detailed diagram of what happens. Um, like what exactly is going on and, and everything uh, so it's, it's a very interesting uh, thing it's it's, like it's showing uh, like all the details of the car the performance and everything the time the temperature everything you need to know everything you want to know if I press the camera button right here guys all right let's see what happens wait what oh it goes on right there What? Okay, guys, um, something is very interesting. I don't know if this is questionable or not, but uh, for some reason you only get rear view cameras and a side view cameras. For a price of 40,000 euros, I find this questionable because usually most uh, crossover SUVs of this segment and price would offer a 360 degree parking camera by then. But in the Subaru um, Forester, I'm under the impression when it comes to technology, I feel a bit like I'm in the 2000s. Another thing I would like to remark, guys, is that uh, this gear stick has makes a lot of noise whenever I change gears. So I'm putting it in park. It's like I have to use a lot of force to move this gear, uh, gear stick for some reason. And then when I want to put it in drive, It makes a lot of noise, guys, and for a price of 40,000 euros, and let alone for the 2020s, but it's just questionable. It's not a very big deal. It's something you can get used to. Okay, guys, I'm going to test the horn of this Subaru Forester. Now, this is going to be a very interesting moment. Uh, let's see what it sounds like. Wait, just one last time I have to test something, guys. Okay, so judging by the sound of the horn, I can already confirm that the, the tone it has sounds very much alike other Japanese 4x4s. And when I say 4x4s, um, I, ha I, I have a Nissan Navara and it has a very, very similar sound to this. Now, the, the components are probably built by the same company and this company distributes it to all Japanese cars. It's very possible, but the tone it has Sounds very similar to my Navarra, so there's a slim chance they probably share this component. I do not know, guys, but uh, the tone is, is similar to every Japanese car I've reviewed, so it's coincidence or not, you be the judge, guys. So this is the exterior of the Subaru Forester, very nice. Um, so this is, uh, this is very interesting, I like the color theme of it, and I really love the design. It's got this uh, similar uh, style overall to the first generation, um, well, to the first two generations actually, it's very interesting. Especially the front, it's, it's quite nice how they've done it. But the most questionable aspect I forgot to mention earlier, guys, is that I did not notice, well, I noticed that there was no front parking camera, but the most questionable aspect is that for a price of 40,000 euros, and let alone 2020s, you do not get front parking sensors. No front parking sensors whatsoever. I, um, like usually most cars traditionally always offer front parking sensors and rear parking sensors and just rear camera without the 360 degree parking camera, fair enough. But this Subaru has something very um, questionable going on. Like, all the security systems are at the rear, all the safety, all the parking aid is at the rear, but the front is completely neglected. Now, look very carefully at the front of this Subaru. The front is very vertical, and this will uh, make it very difficult for uh, the driver to see everything 
from the driver's seat because the bonnet sticks out very proudly so it uh, it hides everything that happens at the front right here guys another questionable aspect I've noticed about this uh, Subaru Forester is that the parts are not aligned when it comes to the bonnets for example you see an elevation going on here on the bonnet compared to this part of the front there's a little elevation if you look carefully so whether this is exceptional for this uh, Subaru Forester or not, it's very debatable. Maybe it was deliberate, I'm not sure guys, but it's not every day you see a bonnet that's elevated more than the other part. Like if you look at this, this is not aligned. And this part as well is not aligned. Like this feels more above than this. So here's my conclusion about the Subaru Forester, everyone. I'm very lost, I'm very mixed for words guys because I saw some great things but every single time I see something great about the Subaru Forester I'm always greeted with something questionable like one, at one point I see something good and then at the next thing I, next thing I see is something questionable overall this Subaru Forester really does say a lot about Subaru today um, I'm under the impression that Subaru has kind of lost interest because you see, the thing is, um, here in the EU market, Subaru has kind of gone down. But I've noticed that in the North American market, they really have been putting a strong fight over there. Like, if you look at their site in North America, they have all sorts of cars. They have so much choices, guys. They even have a seven-seater in North America. Well, I think they do, but I know they have so many great things over there. Here in Europe, especially in Belgium, they're, it's like... I. There, there, there are actually many potential reasons why they are not really present here, and that's possibly because Europe is the EU market is the home of a giant competitor like Volkswagen and the Volkswagen Group, and that too, the Volkswagen Group they own Audi, and Audi is kind of like the Subaru of Europe because the Audi Quattro system it is reputed for being knife through butter when it came to snow, and. Uh, and that too, when it came to company cars, the company cars, they got a better deal with Audi more than they ever had with the Japanese cars. So that's also another thing to remark. And, and here in Belgium, company, company cars are mainly dependent on uh, German brands like BMW, Mercedes and Audi. I, I've never seen Lexus have any contract with them or maybe they do, but it's very rare I see this happening. Um, so unfortunately, Subaru is another case, guys. Uh, so that could explain why Subaru lost popularity here in Belgium because of lack of demand, I assume, and tough competition from European brands. And then also rivaling Japanese brands had more success than Subaru ever did. Uh, like Toyota, Nissan. Well, Nissan kind of survived in the EU market thanks to their alliance with Renault. And Honda... To be fair, Honda is in the middle. They are kind of... They were kind of facing the similar thing going on with Subaru and Mitsubishi. But then at the same time, they had similar success like Toyota, but especially with the unique models like the CRV and the Civic. At the moment, the CRV and the Civic is the only thing that's anchoring Honda here in Europe. Otherwise, in reality, I had a feeling Honda was disappearing. Now, for a price of 40,000 euros, is this Subaru Forester great value for money or not? I have to say, it's okay value for money it's not the best but it's not you know it's not it's not questionable either but hey it's just okay okay it's it's not the best thing ever but hey why not because let me tell you all something it's true something did seem misaligned it's true you didn't it didn't feel like you get for more well it didn't you don't get exactly what you pay for but you do get the unquestionable subaru reliability you heard it guys the most unquestionable thing about this car is the rally reputation also the subaru reliability guys anytime any day whether it's the coldest day of the year or whenever it's the hottest day of the year wherever you are this car will always fire up. Unquestionable, guys. That's unquestionable. But then, you see, the question I have to ask you all is that in this generation, here in the EU market, does everyone really care about reliability? Because from what I'm observing, uh, reliability is very important. But I've also noticed that people here have more of an appeal towards 
design, identity, and also the option list. Because for a price of 40,000 euros, I was under the impression that uh, a lot of things were absent on this Subaru Forester. And especially most alarming would be the front. Like, I'm surprised there wasn't any uh, parking sensor or parking camera at the front. That's very... That's alarming. Okay, that is alarming. But when it came to the interior, infotainment system, when it came to technology in the interior and uh, electronics and everything, that was a bit old school. That felt like some, it felt like something was a bit behind. It didn't feel like as if it was from the 2020s. It felt like I was in the 2010s, like 2012, 2011, you know? So that's, but that's the technical aspect of things. Like, oh, you want my opinion of the Subaru Forester? Oh, I love the Subaru Forester. I love the Subaru Forester, guys. This Subaru Forester may not be promising as people expect, but rest assured, guys, Subaru Forester is very promising in its own ways. It's a car that's not gonna blow your mind at first glance, but in long terms, this car will always serve you. This car is very loyal to you. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and stay tuned for more videos that are on the run. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go on a rally with the Subaru Forester. Bye.